Good evening, everybody. We're because we have a quorum of our board. We're going to call the meeting uh, to order, but it's really a community forum, and we're calling the meeting to order at 5:02. Welcome, everybody. I'm going to give it back to Jeannie. Hi, my name is Jeannie Phillips. I um, am a senior associate at Great Schools Partnership, and I've been um, doing some work with your district for the last few years. I'm facilitating today so that the board members can be really present and listen to community comment, which is mostly what we're doing. And so that's just my role is to hold the space so they can be present. Um, I want to review a few things that are in your agenda and on the table over there if you want copies. Um, and the first is um, on the second page, they, we have these norms for equitable data analysis that we've been using through this process. And I wanna highlight three that I think are important for today. The first is recognize multiple truths um, in the space. The second is maintain a solution-oriented approach. And the third is, as we're engaging in comment, to keep our conversations blame-free. I think everybody here wants what's best for young people in our community. I also just want to frame um, what's been done so far um, in this work. And so one of the documents um, that's available is the criteria that um, the board has developed, that the configuration committee has developed for examining different models. Uh, these criteria were developed um, by the Configuration Committee and then brought for feedback, updated, and then adopted by the board. And they were developed from community feedback that um, the community provided via survey, looking at that data to come up with uh, the criteria we would use to examine different configurations. And then the next thing I want to draw your attention to, oh, I also want to say that the board um, wanted to align those with the core beliefs from the strategic plan. And so they are aligned with the five uh, core beliefs that you also have access to. And then um, I'm going to turn it over to Floor for some comments. Good evening again, everybody. Uh, what we wanted to do is also have like a more formal welcome in be on behalf of the board. Uh, as we gather here tonight, I want to remind everyone that we're all in this together. And I often share the sentiment with community and with board members because it's important to remember that we share the same goals and concerns, which is part of the reason we're all sitting together. It, you know, we were hoping for a circle, but this is the best that we can do. And board members are sitting with you too. Uh, tonight's conversation is just not is not just about closing school, but it's about growing them, growing learning environments, and creating more opportunities for our children and our communities. Uh, as I had said before, we're all interconnected. So tonight, uh, let's reflect and keep in mind our shared vision as we share with each other. Let's keep in mind how we can leverage our core beliefs, which Jeannie just talked about, our strategic plan, and strengthen our programs and ensure success for every student. I want to also remind people that the strategic plan process, which began in early 2023, was built on listening to our community. Over the past 18 months, our strategic plan steering committee worked hard to engage with all and develop a collective vision for Washington Central Schools. And this vision is guided by the core beliefs that you have there. I'm just going to read these five core beliefs because I think it will be helpful as we have this conversation tonight. So the first core belief is humanity, justice, community, and belonging. The second is well-being, then transparent and responsible leadership, community engagement and relationships, and rigorous curriculum and instruction. These values serve as a foundation for our future, and they highlight our commitment to equity, inclusion, and academic excellence. It, tonight's forum is not, just, is not just a meeting, as you know. It's part of our democracy in action. By listening to each other and engaging in meaningful dialogue, we model good citizenship for our students and our broader community. Uh, we have a lot of people with us tonight, uh, you know, and because we have some people online too. Uh, let's remember that we're not here to debate each other, but uh, to work together. Uh, I encourage everyone to use I statements and be kind to one another. Uh, this process, as we all know, won't yield immediate results, but it is a strategic investment in our future. Together we can ensure that our children have the opportunities for deeper learning, personal growth, and a brighter future. We must also acknowledge the significant challenges facing public education in our state. However, this effort is, just a, is not just about closing schools. It's about being strategic in how we strengthen and sustain our broader communities. 
Um, and as board members, we're not here just to represent one town. We represent the broader community and a create, um, you know, a unified vision for our educational system. So as we move forward towards discussion tonight, let's keep that perspective in mind. And we are stronger when we weave our efforts together and we can build a future that benefits all of our children and all of our communities with that. Back to you, Jeannie. The last thing I, I want to point us to is um, the board, the configuration committee didn't just develop criteria and adopt them. They also um, uh, asked for a matrix where we could put different configurations against those criteria and ask the leadership team to do the best they could to look at data to determine which configurations met which criteria. And I think Floor is going to share that so you can have a, a look at that. Um, our criteria fell into two bigger categories, and one was about um, related to student well-being and opportunities. And so it's, um, if you look along the uh, left side are the different configuration models, and then if there is green in the box, it means it meets that configuration criteria. If it's yellow, it partially meets, red does not meet, and blue is not enough information yet. As you can imagine, this data is really um, difficult and time consuming to pull together. So this is that first set. Um, there's a lot of configurations, so there's multiple pages. Um, this is available on the website as well. And then the second set of criteria were related. Um, the first two pages are related to well-being, student well-being, and then I think the maybe it's the fifth, fourth, fourth on uh, pages on is related to fiscal responsibility, sustainability, and impacts on communities. And that data was much harder to collect. Uh, we just wanted to share that that's part of the process, that that's some of the data that the board has been looking at. And then um, we just want to open it up for public comment. Um, we have board members in the in-person audience with uh, microphones. Um, and this is really the opportunity for the board to hear uh, your perspectives. The question we've asked is, as the board makes this decision, what do you want them to keep in mind? The ways that you can participate in this conversation are public comment. There's some chart paper, if you prefer to write, in a couple spots in the room. And then there's also a link to a survey on the website, if you'd prefer to type your response in a survey. Um, Floor is going to add that to the chat right now. So we'll start with in-person public comment, and then we'll move to uh, folks on Zoom. Um, I think Natasha and Daniel both have mics, so if you're interested in commenting, you can reach out to either of them. Uh, my name's Andy Shapiro. I live in East Montpelier. Um, I would ask the board to consider a much broader question at the same time you're considering this, not after which is looking at what's going on in Montpelier right now. They've got a school that's in the floodplain. Um, you know, a new career center would be $100 million estimated. And no reason to think the high school would be much different than that. So there's a huge chunk of money to be saved by consolidating the high school between Montpelier and here. Um, people are really strapped. And we need to think about ways that we can make better sense out of this. The middle school there has room or could have room for all the middle school students. Um, this might obviate the need for closing smaller schools that don't really want to be closed by their communities. But the bigger picture is thinking about this larger region all together as a unit and looking at the, I think there's some pretty good synergies, both cost-wise and educationally. Thank you. Any other public comment in person before I turn to Zoom? Jeannie, can I ask if there's a time limit that people are aware, have to be aware 
No, there, it's it's a community forum. So today is just you should just feel free to speak and or ask questions, whatever. <laughs> and we will wrap start to wrap up at six twenty five. Okay, is there any public comment on Zoom? If you'd like to comment, you could raise your hand in Zoom. Oh, we have a hand. Becca, go ahead and unmute. Okay, I'm unmuting and I'll see if I can start the video. Let's see so you can see my face. Hi, Becca. Hi. <laughs> um, I just wanted to say that the, um, the data that you shared looks really interesting and I haven't had a chance to really process it yet. So I'm wondering if we can shoot you folks emails or something like that later once we've had a chance to really look at the data um, in the matrix that you shared. Mm -hmm. I would say yes, you can always email, but there's also the survey link is another place to express yourself once you've had an opportunity to look at the data. Okay, great, thanks. Uh, let's see, is it Honey? Hi, it is Honey, thank you. Um, is this a time to ask general questions or just with the prompt that you gave us? I just wanna be clear. Uh, it's a good question, honey. I think w the board is here to listen today, so I'm sure we can take your questions, but I'm not sure they're answering questions. Am I right about that? That's okay. Yeah, great. Great, so I will ask you my question, and if the board can follow up with a response, that would be great. I am curious to know, because I have been listening through this process, as you have been, um, if the town of Worcester does not vote to close their school. So essentially if they vote to keep their school open, who or which group is going to decide what is happening in the Doty building next year? And I should preface it by saying I am a teacher at Doty and um, a parent in our district. So I'm wondering who makes the decision about what will be happening at Doty if the residents vote to keep the building open? If, if, the, if the residents vote to keep their building open, honey, I, and you know, this is a public forum, so we can have a, a conversation, but if the residents vote to keep the building open, it would be our budgetary decision, right? Like as a, as a board, we would look at our budget as a whole and, and, and fund our schools and move things as, as needed, right? Without closing the school. So we would respond to our articles of agreement and uh, work, you know, at, at, so I, I essentially, normal process. a normal process, voting a budgetary to, process, right? Yeah. So voting to keep the school open does not guarantee that there would be um, the students that we have in it this year or around the students, whether it's pre-K-5 or K-6, um, voting to keep the building open does not guarantee that those students will be in the building. Is that Correct. Can you confirm that? Correct. Okay. Correct. Yeah. Great. Thank you yeah. for that yeah. answer. I appreciate it. Thanks. I'm going to return to the in-person space and see if there's any public comment here. And I heard, I saw Dell's hand up. This is a really weird question. Um, if, my understanding is that Ballots are, are being sent out this week from all town clerk's offices. So how would there even be a vote by the town of Worcester? How does, how does that work? There, uh, there would be a separate ballot um, that is part of this measure. So we're still within the time frame from, for which we can, if the board votes for it to be placed on a ballot, we would just have to have a separate ballot. Than the and, one that's going and people out. would have to come to town hall or go, I mean, they, it would be you, separate. You can still from, request it separately. They will send it to you if you request it. And then if you go to vote on the, you know, you will get to vote. So, yeah. Okay.
Any other public comment uh, in person? Hi, folks. I'm Rachel Seelig. I've been commenting at meetings. Nice to see you all in person this time. Um, so I want to start with just a quick update. Um, the last time I was uh, participating remotely, I let you all know that I had a letter that 54 some folks had already signed on to. I will resubmit that because now we have 122 signers, and I would like for you to have their names, opposing closing the school, given how little information we have so far. I also tonight want to bring up a couple other points, um, especially given that we don't have time limits. The first is <laughs> that, um, you know, I also sit on the Planning Commission. I'm not here as a member of the Calais Planning Commission, but I think some of what's discussed in our planning commissions is really relevant to this conversation. We all know that Vermont is in a housing crisis, that we have a tremendous housing shortage. Uh, just last month, the Vermont Housing Needs Assessment was released by the Vermont Housing Finance Agency. Washington County is likely projected to need somewhere between 2,289 and 3,385 additional homes between 2025 and 2029. This includes between 780 and 1,646 owner homes and 1,509 to 1,739 rental homes. Just for the town of Callis, to develop 2.8% of this total, which is generally our percent of Washington County, this would involve the addition of between 64 and 95 homes over four, five years. Part of why this is needed is to address the tremendous rise in homelessness across our state. Homelessness just in Washington County has increased substantially since the pandemic. 446 individuals were identified as homeless during the 2023 point in time count. 963 were identified as homeless at the 2024 point in time count, just in Washington County, where we have 92 emergency shelter beds. Folks probably know that families with children have now been kicked out of the motels program and are living in tents and on the streets. And we serve those kids in our district because they have a right under McKinney-Vento to continue receiving education. So for each of the towns, when we get our fair share number from the Regional Planning Committee, we have to make sure that our town plan is such that we can handle our fair share amount of development whether it happens or not. And one of the many concerns that I have, and you're aware of other concerns I have already, is that if Callis really were able to achieve its part of solving the housing crisis in Vermont by adding 95 homes over five years, all these plans you're talking about don't work, right? Because those, ideally, that means we're bringing families with kids into our community. And so this is why I've said several times now that I really think that this needs to be much more about long-term planning for our communities and not just short-term that we've had declining enrollment and that we have small class sizes now. So that's thing number one I want to talk about. Number two is I want to talk about teachers and staff turnover because one of the questions that I think has not been answered clearly for me, I don't know if it's been discussed with the teachers or the union, is what happens to teachers in terms of reassignment if you close Callis and Doty? Are there teachers at those two schools who have seniority over their counterparts at East Montpelier, Berlin, and Romney? Would teachers who are currently at East Montpelier, Berlin, and Romney be reassigned elsewhere? And what does that mean in terms of retaining staff when there are plenty of other schools that our teachers can go to who are desperate for teachers if they're potentially being reassigned to schools that they don't want to work in. So I really think that is a question I think, think needs to be understood because one of the things that I've heard folks complain about is that we've had turnover in teachers. And that's part of the workforce. There's going to be turnover when it comes to our teachers. But is this actually going to exacerbate that problem? Has this been studied at all? Okay, third thing. Earlier today, Vermont Public published an article about whether Act 46 has worked. Uh, 
and they reported the state has never crunched the numbers, but Grace Miller, a Newport native, parsed 15 years of school spending data to answer precisely this question for her undergraduate thesis at Yale. And while her statistical analysis found that merged and unmerged districts ultimately spent about the same amount, she also found they spent money in very different ways. So given that we did not really, as a state, see much change in spending from consolidating the district, once again, I really would like a much better understanding of why we actually think that closing our schools would create savings, especially because one of the demands in closing the schools is to add programming and to do more enrichment, which costs money and has not been costed out. Last, I want to share a couple of other voices. Uh, because I put this letter out, I've heard from some folks individually. I won't necessarily name them, but I think you should hear from folks who feel so demoralized they're not coming to these meetings. One, I'm too wrapped up in other thoughts, but fully support the initiative to hold our local school open. Two, I'm afraid that neither WCSU nor the legislature is interested in making decisions based on data. One of the things that consolidation has met is that we no longer even have meaningful data by school, something I raised last time I spoke. It's also so aggregated that it means nothing, and there's no financial data provided at all. This drives me nuts. I've hesitated to, be hesitated to become vocal on this issue because I feel that, all in all, I've had my turn and my advocacy might be seen as self-interest. There are certainly many opportunities for providing Calis students support and enrichment without closing our school. I would favor joining Callis and East Montpelier and having Callis be a pre-K through three school for both towns and East Montpelier being four through six. Diddy with D Ditto with D Doty and Romney. I have no idea whether that is financially a good idea, but it should be. And hello, Montpelier High School is in a floodplain and the town just spent $75,000 for a consultant to advise about the future when, duh, how about just moving up the hill and Roxbury too, and maybe even Spalding. There are genuine savings there, but we don't appear interested in that. Why not? Here's another person who wrote to me. Last year, I was forced to sell my home in Calais. I've lived there 23 years and would have given anything to remain in my home had there not been some structural issues that I spent six years trying to find someone to help me fix. Anyway, because the property was my family's summer camp when I was growing up, my connection to Calais goes back close to 55 years. I'm also an East Montpelier Elementary School and U32 graduate. I went through EMES when there were multi-grade classrooms for one through sixth grade, and kindergarten was a six-week, half-day program run out of the little building on the county road. While so much has changed, I can say that there were definitely advantages to the multi-grade classrooms, and the teachers were experts at handling it all. I recently read an article, I think from 1969, when Barrytown closed all their neighborhood schools and opened the new Barrytown Elementary and Middle School. This article talked about how bringing the students together in the one building would be an opportunity to build a stronger community. It made me wonder why we've lost sight of how important the school building is to a community and how it is, in fact, the, central, the center of our small communities. There is also the idea of busing six and seven-year-old children from the far corners of Calais to East Montpelier. In the case of my former home, it would be over a 10-mile drive, but with multiple stops, that 20-minute trip could become closer to 45 minutes. I think she's actually underestimating that based on what we've heard about transportation. And that's if it's a straight shot, which we both know would not be the case for all the bus routes through Callis to East Montpelier. Anyway, I just wanted to let you know my heart is with the Callis community, and I hope you are all able to save the elementary school. One more, and then I will give the microphone back. Thank you. I find the thought of closing our school extremely short-sighted. There is no evidence this will save the district nor Callis taxpayers much, if any, money. Plus, we have heard all these promises before of increased services and better outcomes when we were forced to consolidate. One of the, once the school closes, it will never come back. From an economic lens, we will be devoting all of those resources to other population centers that do not directly benefit our town, our citizens, or our tax base. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Else? <laughs> Any other public comment in person? 
It looks like we have someone online who might want to share. Perhaps an accidental mute, unmuting. Anybody online on Zoom want to um, comment? Hi, hello, can yes. you hear me? Okay, I'm Felicia Weeks. I have two children at Callis and I have not had a lot of time to do a lot of research on how closing the schools is actually gonna save money. So I was wondering, is there somewhere where it has a financial breakdown on exactly how closing these schools is gonna save money? I also had a question about paraeducators. We are already short paraeducators. My son um, last year was a one-on-one student. He needed some extra help this year. Um, he's also looking for a paraeducator. We don't have enough resources in that line. And I'm wondering how hitting him in the classroom, that's probably going to be really super overstimulating for him, is going to help him in that way if we're not going to have, I'm assuming we're probably still going to be short paraeducators. So I'm wondering if there's, there's, um, a plan for kids who have special needs. And then I also had a question on why we aren't seeking different solutions. Why are we just focusing on closing the schools to save money? Is there any other solutions that we're exploring? And then my last um, question was, did we do, I know there's a lot of research on how large classrooms can help kids socially, which is important in different other ways, but there, there is a lot of research out there also about how smaller classes can benefit children as well. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Felicia. Dell. Would you wait for a mic, please, Dell? I realize that. Yeah, I'm sorry, because um, I've I get frustrated when I'm zooming and can't hear what's being said. Um, yeah, so I had hoped there'd be a lot of people speaking before. <laughs> I my brain goes in about 50 different directions about this. I'm Dell Waterhouse. I live in Worcester, and I taught there for 26 years. Retired. 13 years ago, um, and, I, and this afternoon I was listening to um, the, the Historical Society in Worcester um, put together, invited people on the 4th of July to come and record, invited alums of Doty to come and record memories and thoughts about, about Doty. And, <laughs> It was quite amazing. I don't know why I hadn't listened to them sooner, but I want to recommend to anybody who has questions about um, the value of a small school in a small town. And um, our school is a part of, we have one village center and our school is an integral part of the, of the, the heart of the village in many, in many ways. Anyhow, hearing these folks talking about going at knowing everyone in the school and being known by everyone and feeling connected to the community in a way that has, um, I mean, some of them were young. Some of these were the age of my, one of my daughter's classmates <laughs> when she was at Doty. Um, and just the, the meaning of that in their lives. And um, beyond that, there are the, so, so if you go to Worcester, Worcester, Vermont Historical Society or to YouTube, Worcester, Vermont Historical Society, there's a series of wonderful short videos to, to listen to. And it, they captured better than I can um, just how, um, how important that feeling of connection to your own community is. And when I was teaching, uh, one of the standards that came in was called um, curriculum of place, and it just resonated so for me. And I feel I feel like 
I, I mean, there is a point at which a school perhaps is too, too small. But 70 some kids, which is what we've had at Doty for um, I don't know how many years, it is like the perfect size in many ways. And there are things that we've been able to do at Doty that you couldn't do at a bigger school. And um, so that, the, the value of multi-age uh, classrooms, which I would never want to go back to a single grade classroom if I didn't have to because of, of the benefits for the kids and for the teacher, or the, uh, the mix of kids, different mix each year, children knowing me, me knowing them, them knowing each other, and a broader connection uh, within the school. Uh, so I'm, I'm a little puzzled about where the, uh, what was the motivation for seemingly proposing single grade classrooms as much as possible. I, I would disagree with that, I guess. And I'm not sure, I, I don't, I've never known the school board to take on that kind of um, role in their relationship with how a school is run, so it kind of surprised me to see that. Beyond that, um, what I guess my biggest hope at this point is that we could slow down and not feel that this decision needs to be made this year, although I, I get it how difficult budgeting <laughs> was last year and promises to be again this year. I really appreciate the people who step up to be on the board and, and to deal with, with such difficult, um, challenging decisions. Nonetheless, I, I, feel, um, I feel like we need to slow down and consider different possibilities. The, the concept of a community school, and I know there's some sort of formal way of thinking of community schools, but we have five buildings that are all in pretty good condition and are at the core of each of our five towns. It seems like there's ways in which we could make use of that space that would work well within and, be, and offer extra resources for each town in, in, oh, if we had the time. <laughs> and I can tell you, We've got the energy in Worcester at this point. Uh, it's it's really amazing how much how much people are coming together around this whole thing. So, I would urge the board to um, to slow down and let us let us all begin to look into this more. I think each of the towns is just beginning to to realize what it is that we're what we're all trying to solve. I, I agree. We're all in this together. And uh, it and it would be great if we could if we could get more folks involved in trying to figure out how to how to keep what we need for each town to feel vital and connected with um, within our town and, and our community our kids feeling really um, knowing they're an integral part of our community. Thanks. Um, we have some. Uh folks on Zoom with their hands up. So we'll go back to Zoom and then come back to the in-person. Um, we're gonna start with the folks who haven't spoken yet on Zoom. So we'll start with you, Lisa. Thanks, um, Lisa Hanna Worcester, I'm a former teacher in the district and current parent of two students at Doty. I guess just the feedback that I would offer right now, um, having you know, you've all seen my face before, been involved in this process, and I've spoken at other meetings. Um, and I'm just thinking about this forum and uh, the attendance and the amount of folks who want to speak. And I'm just wondering, or I guess I, I guess I wish that at this point in the process that the questions being asked of us at public forums were a little more specific. Um, it feels like the questions along the way um, at multiple opportunities for the public to offer feedback are very broad and vague, like, what do you what do you want what do we want you to know and it feels like that question has been asked multiple times um and and there's probably value in that but i also feel like there's a point where it would feel more um 
more like we're being heard if then the next layer of questions at the next forum um, had a little more specificity in terms of what information you wanted from us um, because it feels like to some degree there has been a lot of information shared and I'd like to know more what else you want to hear from us. Um, so the, the broad questions over and over have been a little bit um, troubling for me personally. Thanks. Thank you, Lisa. Alina. Hello, um, if you can hear me. Um, this is my first forum, um, so I'm I'm still getting up to speed, but um, I wanted to make a couple of comments. We're a um, returning family to the Calus area. Um, uh, we have a strong affiliation for our Calus community, but our children have also had the joy and pleasure of making friends in our neighboring towns um, in Worcester, um, in East Montpelier, um, in Berlin, and Mont you know Montpelier. And so I would just say that, you know, I think as much as we have community in small town, we also have community um, in a larger sense. And so I, I just I just want to say that um, that we're all one community trying to work together. Um, I have to say from having experience with children in other schools coming back to Calus, we really wanted to be here, um, but it's been really hard for our family to find the same kinds of opportunities as we had in other kind of um, more resource um, intensive districts. Um, you know, it's been my kids, if we want to go to aftercare, have to spend, you know, more than an hour on a bus ride just to make it between Calus and East Montpelier for a pre-K or a kindergartner. This is really hard. Um, it's also really hard to find any kind of other childcare options. Um, and I would just, I know this isn't solving all our problems, but I just, I think that is an important part of the equation, making sure that wherever we go next, if we're anticipating recruiting more families to the area, that we have um, a, a system that actually serves families. And so when we have a choice to move to Vermont, um, that callous, that Worcester, that these communities and these towns are actually the places that people choose to live and bring their families. Um, so I think there's, you know, great community, there are great schools, there are great people, um, but the logistics of having a family here are often not always so easy, um, especially for two working parents and really high cost of living. <laughs> so I just want to say that. Um, and I think, you know, we you know, things are only getting more expensive with inflation, with healthcare, with, you know, with all, with all of the factors you have all been talking about. And so I think we have to be really cognizant that if we don't start planning now, um, you know, if we're not able to recruit the hundred plus families that, you know, I, I'm not even sure if that would tip the scale, you know, I haven't seen the numbers, but um, that we make sure that we're still here and we're still surviving and we still have um, high quality education for our kids in the meantime. So I respect the wish to, you know, plan long term, but I think we also have to be realistic about what we can achieve in 5, 10, 15 years. Um, so thank you. And I know this is really hard, but um, thank you all for, for thinking about these hard problems. Thank you, Alina. Ainsley. Hi, thanks. Um, if it's all right with you, I'm going to remain uh, camera muted because it's mayhem in my house and it would really save you all um, not to see a toddler running around. Um, so I had followed this conversation uh, pretty intensely last year and I've fallen off a little until now. Um, as a teacher in our district, the fall is a busy time for me, but I'm also a parent in Middlesex. Um, I had some concerns about this conversation last year and coming back to the table now, I'm surprised to hear a lot of the concerns I had last year still seem to be themes. Um, those being, there really doesn't, there's not enough information. What will this reconfiguration look like for our students? What will the cost savings be? And I will apologize if that information is out there and I just haven't seen it all. Um, but I heard another community member asking about what transitions for teachers to different schools will look like. And I, being a school teacher in our district who was transferred this year, know that it um, it, it is really an awkward place to be. Um, which brings me to the idea of time frame. I think 
and as other people have said, I understand why our board is um, under a rush here, but I think the time frame that we're pushing down doesn't allow time for processing and celebrations. It kind of seems like this is something that's just being enforced or forced upon us, which uh, for me doesn't sit well as it didn't last year when I was told I needed to change schools to remain an employee. Um, so I'm wondering if this could be a different thing, if we allowed more time, could this be more of a thing of celebration? Could we have time to process and um, celebrate the school for what it was and kind of like have that grieving before moving into a new arrangement? I think even logistically, time makes sense. <laughs> Figuring out things like, who will the principal in this building be? Because I imagine those things need to be negotiated when we have five principals and we're going to cut that. Um, I would agree with some of what other people have said regarding thinking long term and thinking that this plan is a little uh, short sighted. But uh, my big question is um, regarding your job as stewards, and I do appreciate so much what you do for our schools, and I, I can't say that enough. I understand your devotion and really appreciate your role in our community. Um, but as community stewards, it's my understanding that your job is to act as representatives for community members. And I'm wondering what what this could look like, because you've you've hosted these um, public forums and you've put out surveys, but they have, um, at least from what I've seen, uh, been pretty similar. And I'm wondering what a survey regarding this specific vote would look like. Would the board stand behind putting a survey out asking what community members um, would say regarding a vote on um, specifically reconfiguration. And I think that's all I have to say. So thank you so much for your time. Thank you, Ainsley. Jeff. Okay. Um, hey, I'm Jeff Dean. Thank you. Thank you so much for um, posting these for us. Uh, come to some and listen to things online. Um, I guess the the question I have is it does seem like there's been quite a bit of time gone by where, as Lisa was saying, there are lots of questions and comments that be, kind of start to float free because these comments and questions go in and then and there doesn't seem to be a clear sense of what is the process whereby these comments and questions are going to be taken account of how that those questions and comments are going to be factored in, into decisions that are made. And a lot of these comments and questions are about, you know, feelings. And that's fair enough. That That's things that people need to express. And I think those things are worth expressing and worth hearing. And those are important considerations. But there isn't sort of an answer to whether or not, the, you know, the, the school in Callis really is the center of the community or not you know that's some people feel that it is some people feel that it isn't Th these are things that people can express but there aren't going to be clear answers to them but a lot of the questions seem to be things where there are either is or should be actual data to answer the questions things about whether there would be cost savings and what they would look like things about what the bus routes would like if they were changed things about what would happen to the teachers if we if these things were reconfigured things about you know i you know there's mixed data on some too like for example my kids in callis have not had a good experience with multi-age you know multi-age classrooms um some people seem to think that's wonderful it hasn't been wonderful for my kids so i'm sure some stuff is also ambiguous i guess my my main question or statement is it seems like there's a lot of rehashing of things without a sense of, okay, well, what is it? How are we going to get answers to these questions? And, and what are those answers going to be based on? And is it going to just be a consensus in the sense that, well, most people seem to feel this, so that's what we'll do? Or is it, nope, these, these questions and claims are based on misunderstandings, and that's going to be clarified. We're going to let people know, actually, you will save money, or actually, this isn't mainly about saving money, it's about something else, and so on. So I'm just more a kind of question about how the whole process is supposed to play out in a way 
that doesn't simply seem like a reiteration of the same things that I've been hearing for several months now from online and in the fora. And, and that I have started, to, I feel like I almost can't keep track uh, myself, even though I'm trying hard to. Uh, um, but to, to sum up, I really appreciate everybody's efforts. And I really do appreciate that this is a hard issue. And I'm so glad that, you know, people are participating. Um, so thanks. Thank you, Jeff. Um, before we take the other two hands in the um, Zoom room, these folks have already had an opportunity to speak. Is there anybody in the physical room that would like an opportunity to speak that hasn't yet? How's my wait time? Good? Okay. Becca. Hi, I'm just following up on my other question. I can't find the the data set um, that you shared at the beginning of the meeting on the website. Is it in the packet? Am I just unable to navigate a website effectively? Which is very possible. This is like feels it's Wednesday, but it feels like like. 12 Fridays from now already. But, I, I but. feel you, Becca. Um, Flora is going to find it, and she's going to paste it in the chat. So she's going to the website right now. Would you and, like to then, stay for that? Yeah. Do you have another comment, or should I no, move on? No, and then just if you could follow up and just let us know where it is, so if we want to share with people. Okay. She's going to think paste the direct link into the chat from the website. Um, let's see. Honey. Thank you. Um, just a few quick things that I was really unprepared for, but I really appreciate this dialogue because it's, it's opening up lots of my thoughts. Um, as a teacher who works in a grade that might be moved, in a town that might be school, that might be closed, it's scary right now to be a teacher. And I understand that in some ways a school district has to run like a business. And that is hard for people who show up for way more than eight hours a day for 180 days and put their whole heart and soul into the community that they build in their classroom and in their school. And um, jumping on what Dell was saying, and Dell is such a wealth of knowledge about Dodie. Um, I just read, and I'm gonna put it out there for all of you, a book called Never Enough, and it's by Jennifer Wallace. And the theme of the book is how it's so important to teach students their value in their community and that they all have value. And I can tell you that is something that Dodi is hitting spot on right now. That is what we are aiming to do. We really believe in the value of community and um, connecting our students. So I want our students to be more than a number. I don't want it to be, well, you are the smallest school, so you are closing. And I know there's more factors at play. Um, but that is a lot for our students. I just really need that to be understood, that it is a lot. It's almost too much for our students. Um, and lastly, I know that, that there is a lot of discrepancies between the elementary schools and U32, and I have a love for all of them, um, but there are huge discrepancies. I have an 11th grader. I know that many of his classmates are at tech and that we have a lot of students at early college and those are wonderful programs. Um, but I've also surveyed a lot of kids to see what their lowest class enrollment is and it's small. And I think there is some work to be done to find some cost savings at U32 now that things are shifting. Things are shifting, kids have different opportunities and enrollment is going down in that 11th, 12th grade because of those amazing opportunities. So I don't want to just focus on our youngest residents who are so embedded in their communities and um, really needing that connection to their community. So thank you. Thank you, honey. Oh, yes, there's Natasha has a mic and Daniel has a mic right in front of you, too. The red behind. Hi, uh, Noah Weinstein from Worcester. Um, I wasn't planning on speaking tonight, but I'm going to. Um, and my apologies if the question I'm about to ask sounds a little snarky. Um, but my question is that if either Worcester or Callis votes to keep our schools open, if it ends up going to a vote and we decide to keep our schools open, 
I'm wondering if there are any other towns in the district that would like to volunteer to close their schools instead. Um, because I was running the numbers and it turns out that there are actually several other reconfiguration options that would also fit given the new reconfiguration numbers we got, or the new student numbers we got on September 18th. So all of Rumney could fit in East Montpelier. Um, both East Montpelier and Rumney could fit at U32. East Montpelier or Rumney could be split to fit between Doty and Callis. And if we say we don't want to split schools, that was the plan for Berlin in, in, the, third, in the third option. So, um, so that's also an option. Berlin could also fit at U32. So if Worcester and Callis vote to keep our schools open, what about these other configuration options? Does any other town want to do that instead? And so I asked the question of sort of, does it feel different if it's your town whose school is on the chopping block, right? That, that it's easy to go, oh, well, you know, I'm, there have been a number of comments about for the good of the whole. And so I think it's important to recognize, like, would any other town like to do this instead? My hunch is probably not. And if not, I'm wondering if we could find a better way that doesn't involve closing any of our schools so that we get to keep all of our kids in our communities with the experience of connectedness and relating to that core value of connectedness and community. Um, the other comment that I wanted to share is a comment about vision in that there's been a lot of conversations during this whole process about sort of the, the bad stuff that would happen if we don't close these schools, that we're gonna have to spend a lot of money, that there's these things that these kids don't get. A question that's been asked over and over again is when we talk about these expanded enrichment opportunities, beyond band and chorus and maybe a half an hour of world language if that passes the budget, I haven't really been offered a vision of like what we'd get out of it as Worcester residents. You know, we'd get this building maybe that we would then have to pay for um, as taxpayers. You know, we'd get certainly, you know, longer bus rides or maybe not longer bus rides because the bus rides right now are inequitable and ridiculous. Um, but I just don't, I don't, I don't get a sense that like this would be better for my kid. And I'd love to hear how that might be better for my kid, but I haven't heard it yet. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anybody else in person who wants to speak before I turn back to Zoom? Uh, Del, I see your hand. Would you mind if I went to Trina, who hasn't spoken yet? And then come back. Okay, Trina. Uh, hello. Here I am. Yeah. Hi, um, my name's Trina, and um, I'm a parent educator at EMES, and um, also a parent of one of the current fifth graders. And um, I'm concerned about this group of students being moved to U32 um, in their sixth grade year. And um, yes, I'm biased. My baby, I want to spend forever at EMES because it's a wonderful school. But the sixth graders have entered this year knowing it's their last year at EMES. But I don't feel like the fifth grade is being prepared at all for this reality that it seems like this is where we're going is that sixth grade will get get moved up to U32 and I feel like they are not ready to go next year and I want to know how the board is planning on preparing them because I think a lot of them don't even know that that's an option they don't realize that this might be their last all school hike on Friday and that their last first day at EMES already happened. And I think that they need to be prepared for that potential seemingly almost inevitable change that's going to happen. And my concern is how do we prepare them and how do we make sure that they are going to be okay with this change? And I know you can't make sure everybody's okay, but my concern is for this age group and this particular class has had a really rough go at school through COVID and everything else. And I'm just concerned how they will react when they find out whenever this decision is made, oh, 
by the way, get ready for U32 next year. So that is my concern. And I thank you for your time. Thank you, Trina. Addy. Hi, my name is Alex Wheeler. I'm actually not Addy. I'm Addy's husband. Um, we Welcome. are, uh, I'm a parent of a fifth grader who has been at Berlin Elementary since kindergarten and now is attending East Montpelier Elementary um, as a fifth grader. Uh, I have been following this stuff pretty closely. Um, it's pretty dear to my heart, everything that's going on. We have a lot of family and friends in Callis, a lot of family and friends in Worcester. And as I mentioned, we have a fifth grader. So everything Trina just said was like on the tip of my tongue. Um, I am going to go out on a limb and say, I feel like as a parent of a child in this district, the board and whoever is in charge of the decisions that are made for our district seem to not have the best interest of our children in mind. I don't know if these people have been to the schools. Berlin Elementary is quite the show right now. I don't know if people need to see what's going on at the school, but my son left there last year. There was a lot of issues at the school. So we're at a new school now. Um, but to fall back on what Trina said, he, they were the COVID kids. Um, I believe they the pandemic started and they got sent home and had to learn about everything. I think he was in first grade. No, he was in kindergarten at that point. And getting back to school, they were required to wear masks. They were required to wash their hands. Um, the administration at his school had them shaking their hands to not use paper towels. And that is absolutely unacceptable in our house. So we're facing... COVID protocol issues in our home life issues, stuff that was going on at school. So to say that these kids have had an extremely hard time is, I just, I don't think you understand what we are saying as parents when we say that to you all. Um, I appreciate everything that everybody is doing, but again, um, slow down would be my, my biggest input. Um, I was on the board or whatever committee that was formed at Berlin Elementary pre-pandemic before the pandemic was even a thing. We were slated to get a new playground. The kids voted on what they wanted. They were going to have a playground. Well, what happened to that playground? That budget is gone. Where did all the money go? Um, and, you know, like some other people, where's the nitty gritty on the money in the details I'm not seeing it. Last year when we had to vote somehow, and I may be incorrect, but I believe central office had not been audited or whatever. So no budgetary changes were able to be made out of central office. And I mean, that may be convenient. I may be a taxpayer thinking, well, isn't that convenient? That's where all the money is. But I, I don't know. I just feel like the board is not listening to us parents uh, in our input, whether it's the poor parents of the kids at Worcester or Callis or the teachers at Worcester or Callis that are worried about their jobs. You know, the bus rides, the bus rides are already long for a lot of people. What is this going to look like? Like these are, these are details that have not been explained. And then the last thing, I guess I'll, I'll wrap it up because I'm kind of going on and on about multiple things is what about like, like Trina said, our, our son's first day is going to be his last day. We haven't told him, Oh, you're graduating this year, but potentially they could be graduating this year. So are they graduating with the sixth graders? Or are they going to have a separate graduation because they deserve that. And these kids deserved their first day as the oldest class in the school that they're never going to get. Um, I just, I, I just think people need to slow down. I understand there's a lot of money involved, but I also, you know, find it kind of funny central office that no budgetary changes last. Like it just seems like there's a lot of things that are kind of not being, 
talked about and a lot of things that are not being considered. Uh, another point that I wanted to make was I have sent emails, my wife has sent emails, and we know people that have sent emails about regarding the fifth, the sixth grade move to U32. There's been no reply. Some people said, like Berlin this evening, I know, has an open house. I know parents that are at the open house that cannot be here to do this. Like, this is extremely hard to, to make these meetings and, and, and give our input and then to feel like our input is not being used or acknowledged at all. Um, so to conclude, I would say, please just slow down and yeah, give the community the time that they deserve. Come look at what's going on in these schools. Like people have said, come look at what a great experience it is for Worcester who has 70 kids. Look at the quality of school those kids are getting. Is it great? Um, it probably is, but thank you. Thank you for everybody's time. Um, please slow down. Thank you, Alex. I'm gonna turn back to the in-person room and see if there's anyone who hasn't spoken who would like to speak. Anyone in the in-person room who has spoken who would like to speak again? I see Dell's hand. Okay, the concept of vision reminded me of something that I've never figured out how to propose it, but when we moved here in 1981, U32 had a pre-K program at the school, and it involved, it, well, so there were preschoolers there, and it involved high school kids um, participating in that and also being able to observe young kids. And it was, it, so it was a resource for families. There weren't a lot of preschools around back then, as I recall. Um, but that, it seems like that could be a wonderful way to use some of the extra space that's at U32 and that that would benefit families in all sorts of ways. I also think we should be working on how to have um, make sure that we've got local um, early childhood things happening in every town for, for parents, families' sakes. But I love that idea, so I got a chance to say it. Thanks. Thank you, Dell. Anyone else in the room before I turn back to Zoom? Lisa. Hi, I just, now that we have the link to the um, the new criteria co or configuration matrix that you had showed briefly at the beginning, um, I just had a couple follow-up questions that might be valuable for folks to know before the end of this meeting. Um, one is just specifically where this will be posted. I see Floor said she'll ask central office to post the updated one. It's hard to know, like, will that just be in, in meeting resources or on that there is a configuration part of the website? In, in the uh, configuration page, uh, honey, it's just right now it's under Lisa. the, uh, Lisa, sorry, <laughs> Lisa. Uh, under the configuration page, it would be there, but it would also be in the meeting resources. We try to put it in both, but when I went into configuration today, it's not under configuration, just on the meeting resources. Okay, so and then, thank you. The other question is, as I'm just taking a brief look at it, I'm just curious if there could be clarification around the light blue coding, which um, is keyed as not enough data, and then just empty boxes. Um, there's a variety, um, especially in things around community schools or magnet school. There's like a couple categories that have a lot of light blue boxes, which is not enough data. And I'm curious if there would be more information about what that means. Does that mean that data was sought and that data doesn't exist? And then how does that differ from boxes that are just blank? Does that mean that that data wasn't sought? It's just a little confusing to have blank boxes and light blue in terms of knowing um, whether we just haven't found the data yet or whether we're looking for the data currently. Um, so clarification on the difference between that coding would be really helpful, particularly because specific models tend to be heavily loaded with light blue or blank boxes and other models seem to have more data affiliated with them. 
So hey, I'll, I'll just say that there's no blank boxes. So it might be the PDF that might be showing you a black box. We, we have just the green, the red, and the not enough information, and, and the yellow for you know, partially meets. So it, it might, you know, so I'm curious in where you have uh, white boxes, but let me make sure that you have the updated one. I and, click, just so you know, I did click the link that you put in the chat and there's there, I don't know, maybe others can confirm who are looking at this document, but there's a fair amount of blank boxes. I'm okay. also seeing so, those, Lisa, it's Becca looking online and I see a lot of them yeah. too, too. So you have the one from the, I'm, I'm just going to put you as a viewer right now. I have the actual Google Doc uh, right now and the one that is posted is the one that was posted at the meeting. The board review it and, and uh, update it, the, the table at our last meeting. And then the district community schools, uh, basically what it says there at the beginning is that it could be combined in any configuration. And we're going to try to it not try, but we're planning on sharing a little bit more about that at our next meeting. And I just placed the, the new, the, as, as a viewer, and let me know if you can see it. Do you want to speak, uh, Stephen, to the, that there's not, that the data doesn't exist for some of those, and that's why they end up with blue boxes? No, I, I, I appreciate that question, Lisa, and we'll work on trying to make sure that we can distinguish where we can't have, where we don't have data and where we can't find data. Um, and so those might be some different, uh, different ones. But I, I hear the question. We'll see what we can do. And Claire, Claire, can you just clarify what you mean you put? us as viewers i don't have a new link i i have it i'm trying to put it on the on the website you'll see it on the on not on the website because i can't post on the website i'm putting on the chat just give me a minute okay i, I think Thank floor you. is trying to multitask and um answer questions uh copy and paste links and um put it in the zoom while her computer is also the one we're using to look at zoom to take hands so uh apologies for that it just takes a lot of bandwidth to do all of those things at once. Um, so it's coming your way. She's working on it. Uh, there, yeah, she's getting there. She just had it big. Um, okay, it's coming your way. Let's see, David, I see your hand raised. Thank you. Hi. David Lawrence, Middlesex. Um, I actually don't have very much to say other than first a recognition that for everybody, this is super hard um, what you're going through. I recognize that the school board has put a lot of effort into it and I you know, trust that you are making the uh, what you think are the best decisions uh, for, your, um, for your role. Uh, I also though wanted to say that uh, despite being from Middlesex and these plans largely having no impact on me or my family, except for the very ambiguous possibility that we might save a few bucks on our taxes. Um, I actually, if we were having a vote right now, I would vote against the plan. I agree with the uh, parents from Worcester and Callis that feel like this is just moving too quickly. It feels like it's moving more quickly than it really needs to be moving. And so I want to add my voice to those saying, look, let's please just slow it down and actually take more time to study the problem, understand the full problem space, pro problem space and the budget um, issues involved. I do recognize, and I know why the board is dealing with um, our declining enrollments, the population challenges we have, the taxes challenges we have, the skyrocketing cost of healthcare, which is unfortunately what's really causing so much of this problem. Um, so it's not, again, I'm not trying to denigrate the work you've been doing. I just think that we, we shouldn't be taking a vote on this yet, and we should be slowing down and taking much more time to, to really look at how we can uh, possibly accommodate communities being able to keep their schools open. Thank you, David. Uh, I'm going to come back. I see two hands that have spoken before, so I'm going to come back and check in the room again. Uh, we have about um, 15 more minutes. Chani. Um, I just have a question about the data and where to find it. I can't find it on the configuration page or the board resources page. Which one? The metrics, Shani? It's nowhere yeah. to be found. It's, yeah, it's in the it's in the res it's in the resources page under the packet, which is what you have it's there. Not, yeah. It's not. It's not. It's not on the website. It's not there. That, yeah. yeah. I'll, I'll, I'll post Unfortunately, the link that I, if if you're we'll on Zoom, it's it's in the packet, and and I'll show you where it is. It's not so. in the packet that's posted. Unfortunately. 
But that's, uh, anyway, I just wanted to make sure I wasn't missing it. I think it's just not there, but that's okay. Thank you. We'll, we'll get it up. I we'll just posted the, the link. It's in the old packet, and that's why I had it all. Yeah, it's on the old packet. It's in the old packet. Yeah. No, it's in the, I'll, I'll show you. It's what I posted we'll online. It does, but I will get it on. Yes, thank you. Are there any other voices in the room that haven't spoken yet that would like to speak? Yeah. Uh, Daniel or Natasha, we have. Yeah. Thanks. Also multitasking. Yeah. It's on. Yeah. It's on now. Maybe, maybe we should try the other one. It's, it's oh, fine. Fine. Hello? No. Hello? Hello. Hello. I'm good now. I got it. She's got a lot. We're good. Hello. Uh, I just wanted to say, um, to echo a lot of other speakers, that this feels like it's moving too quickly. I understand there are budgetary issues, um, but there is a wealth of knowledge and ability, both on the board, in our communities, in the administration. Uh, and I think if we take the time to do it right, to do it with the full five town communities input, uh, we can really come up with creative, not solutions, but different configurations across all of our schools, including the U32 campus that would enrich the full K through 12 experience for all of our students and for students that haven't even enrolled yet. You know, Central Vermont itself is a wonderful place to be, but we're not going to continue to attract or keep quality residents uh, who want to raise families here if we're not really looking far into the future in all of our modeling, in all of our options. And we can do that. It's hard. It's really hard. Closing a school is hard. Creating a new program is hard. Coming up with new options is hard. But we can do that. We're very capable, and we owe it to our children to do our best for them and to create better for them and not to just react to the need to cut budgets because of X, Y, and Z. And in my household, it's been really hard to not let my child think of themselves as a dollar amount and to not have their self-worth uh, squished because their existence costs taxpayers money. So we need to be really careful in how we're framing things because children are wonderful listeners and they're very intelligent and they're going to make associations within themselves that it's our job to, it's just our job to take care. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, I see a name on Zoom that hasn't spoken. Michelle. Hi, thanks so much. Um, I'm Michelle Salvador. I'm from, I'm from Worcester. Um, I have a son at U32. Uh, there was some research that came out. I, I have sent a letter and I and I wasn't prepared to speak tonight, but there has been some uh, research that has come out around um, equity and school closures and um, students who attend a school that closes during their K to 12 career have been found to have lower test scores along with worsening attendance and behavior in the short term. And in the long term, they've been shown less likely than their peers to complete college and have a job and their earnings tend to be lower. Um, and that's some data that just came out in June. And I think that the one thing that I don't hear talked about a lot during this conversation is equity. And equity needs to be really at the top of the conversation. Um, because closing a school is a huge equity issue. So it's not just equity in terms of the outcomes for the children and the schools that are being closed. Um, there's an equity issue among um, parents and families and community. And I think the research really clearly shows that 
while you might be reducing some budgetary burden, which I will are, which I, I believe is not going to end up being that much. And I will say that I am very happy to pay for education and I'm very happy to pay for taxes for education for our children. Um, but I think there's going to be a lot of impacts, especially on um, families where both parents work and um, families um, that are on the side of lower income. And I think that's gonna be a very real issue. I think we're really being short-sighted and just um, shifting the impact and the stress over these families. And so I would agree also that um, it's really time to slow this down and consider these things. I think also the long-term health impacts um, are really clear in all of the data that the CDC shows us around connectedness, both community um, and family and school connectedness. This has long-term serious health outcomes for children. So I think that equity and the issue of connectedness and health, and not just like right now and money right now, but future long-term health outcomes for the children who are our future need to be at uh, the top of the list. Thanks so much for hearing from me. Thank you, Michelle. Anybody who hasn't spoken who would like to speak in these last uh, seven or so minutes in the room? Anybody, I, I'm waiting just to make sure that there are voices we haven't heard from yet. And so, and then I'll, I'll see if there's anybody in the room who has spoken who would like to speak briefly, because we have two more people online who would also like to speak. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Um, so I'm finally getting a hand on the, the matrix. And um, the, the suggestions that I might offer are that when you make the three elementary school option all green across the board, it seems dishonest. And so I'm just going to make a couple of suggestions for the matrix. So for example, where it says class size meets EQS standards for maximum number of students in a class, that doesn't say average. That says that each class would meet those standards, and that's not the case in the new configuration model, because there are classes that are above that standard in the Rumney Doty in the middle sex option, and there are also still classes that are below that in the Rumney middle sex option, in the middle sex option. So I would encourage that to go yellow. The other one would be the healthy classroom configurations, allows for intentional classroom configurations that are aligned with program standards. That word intentional again makes me think of the multi-age thing. And in this, in the in the Berlin, and sorry, in the in the middle sex um, combined, there would probably need to be a multi-age unless you're gonna split the you know, split the music and art room. So again, you could just call that yellow and it would probably seem a little bit more realistic. Um, similarly, under the box of equitable opportunities for students, I think that, you know, to, to Michelle's comment about equity, there is also access to a school in your local community. And children in that model would not get access, and we've been talking a lot about connectedness and that's different than world language and art. It is critically important. So again, I would encourage that that box go yellow. And if we could look at each of these options and say they all have pros and cons, as opposed to saying, well, the option that we're pushing, it's all pros. It just doesn't look honest and it makes me like throw this whole thing in the trash. So that would be my encouragement. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'm going to go to the two folks online, and then I'm going to come back to you. Uh, Honey? Thank you. I hope Dell can hear me because I was thinking the same as Dell. Um, when you put forward the two-school model of having an early child care center at Berlin, it was very forward thinking, and it was also looking to solve a huge issue in our state, which is um, early child care. We need more early child care um, resources. And... That was decided against because we didn't want to move our babies out of our towns. But what if we look to have an early, like a birth to three space in every school and we were renting out to already established childcare centers? I would vote and accept um, like a new position in our district to help support that. And that is community-based. That is solving a problem. 
Um, so I just want to throw that out there as an idea. Um, and I also just want to clarify that when we vote, we're voting um, to close two schools and to send sixth graders to U32. They're kind of all bundled. So we don't have um, data on which, how, what each of those would save budgetary. We don't have cost don't, savings for closing Callis and cost savings for closing um, Doty and cost savings for sending sixth graders. Is that correct? I don't think the board has decided what they're putting on the ballot yet. We, we haven't decided what we're putting in the ballot, but anyways, what we would be putting in the ballot, the only thing that, you know, not even board members, the only thing that the public is going to vote on on the articles of agreement is to close the citizens or uh, voters of Callas are going to vote on closing Callas and the voters of Worcester are going to vote on, vote on closing Worcester. Moving if sixth grade, yeah. If they're on the ballot. If they are on the ballot, which we have, the board would have to decide yeah. that on okay. October 1st. That is what is on the ballot. Sixth graders is not on the ballot. Okay, thank you for clarifying. I appreciate the extra time to ask that question. Yeah. Um, I'm gonna go to, we just have a couple minutes left, Jeff. All right, thanks again. Um, I just wanted to say, uh, just one other thing, which is, it seems like a lot of the framing is around some people thinking the main reason we would do this is budgetary. And I realize that is an impetus, but there are lots of other reasons uh, that this consolidation might be better than the alternatives or not. I mean, I, I have to say, I have to put my cards on the table and say, I'm somebody who's perfectly willing to entertain consolidation if I thought it was better. I don't think there's an intrinsic reason to have a school in Calais. And people talk about community, which I also agree is important, and equity, which I also agree is important. It's not clear to me that community can't be had across town lines. Um, and it's not clear to me that equity might not be improved in certain ways by consolidation. But what is pretty clear to me, at least from my perspective, is that whether or not you're for or against these things, it's very hard to make a decision with the data we have now based on anything other than intuition and a kind of pre-existing bias toward either closing them or keeping them open. I would love to make this decision based on what I see as cogent reasons, really solid data, having all the kind of stuff we, we, we would want before us. And I just, just don't know if it exists or even can exist. I, I hope it, I mean, I obviously I appreciate all the work the board has done with putting matrices together and giving us some indication of some of the data. So just the last way I want to phrase this is, even though I am sympathetic to the idea of closing schools, I actually don't, I, I agree with the people who are saying, if not slow down, at least I, I would need a lot more clarification uh, uh, before I would vote to close a, a school at this point, even though I am somebody who's been on the side of, I could I could see that happening. So. Thank you. Thank you, Jeff. We have one final word. Okay. So I want to reinforce something I've heard from a bunch of folks tonight, um, which is we've asked a lot of questions. I personally have asked a lot of questions, and I don't feel like I've gotten answers to almost any of them. That when I've come back to the next meeting and the next meeting and the next meeting, there's not been a document produced. For example, somebody just talked about having zero through three available at our elementary schools. I think that was in my first list, list of questions is, have you considered renting space out in our elementary schools so that we could have full day, full year, zero to five available in each of our towns, right? So one of the things, one of the, believe it or not, I actually could be convinced to vote for closing my, my town school, but I'm not there at this point because I don't feel like almost any of the questions that we've asked have been answered. And typically, in a public comment process, even though not every single question has to be answered, there is some level of summary response to the questions and the issues raised. Um, and that has not happened here, and I think that is yet another reason that having a vote on October 1st about putting this on the ballot in November doesn't make sense. I think that there is data that is available that we haven't gotten 
where maybe you've gotten it, but it has not been shared with the public. And so until that happens, I think you're asking voters to vote blind, and that's not fair to any of us. Thank you. Thank you all for your participation. I'm gonna turn it over to Floor to close the meeting. Well, I just wanted to thank everybody for coming. Uh, we have a document of frequently asked questions where we keep trying to add our very best, and I know that is not perfect, uh, all the new questions that we get from community members, and we have some, but we, you know, we, we're gonna do better. We will have a lot, uh, not a lot of new information, but information for our last, uh, for our next meeting. I invite you to come to our October 1st uh, meeting where we will be trying to make a decision of how we move forward, you know. So, and it would be a callus. And, and the reason that I, I, that question has been asked to the, why is it a callus? The reason this has been a callus is because that's how we have scheduled our meetings. The board met and had a retreat in, uh, in June, in August, sorry. And we typically try to go around so that we are visiting our schools. We at least get a sense of our different schools. And the first uh, meeting was scheduled at Callas, and that's where we would be. So thank you again, everybody, for, for coming. Uh, we really appreciate your, your input, and this makes, you know, we try to make our data better based on your questions and your, and your input, and the board is committed to all of our communities. So thank you for being here. And the survey, uh, the link is posted in, in the chat for the people on chat. It's posted on the website, too, for people that are wanting to uh, give us more input and again we have the chart paper here and and if you want to take a minute to write something before you leave but thank you for being here thank you Jeannie for helping us facilitate and thank you board members for being here thank you Stephen and Spencer and Orca and everybody and Lisa thank you always for your meetings and, and thank you Ella for being here listening to us too so I with that we're gonna uh, adjourn by consensus because my battery is dying too so before we become pumpkins. Thank you, everybody. We'll see you next. And also, it's on a Tuesday, right? So it's a little different, but it's on a Tuesday. Trying to you know, respect everybody's holidays. Okay, see you next week. <laughs>